to our doors open day presentation brought to you by the Royal Town Planning Institute West of Scotland Chapter Committee. I'm Jane and I've been on the, a member of the committee for five years and was the convener in 2019. Today's presentation is a talk through tour of Glasgow's lesser known species, um, species that were visited by our members of the committee uh, during lockdown whilst the travel restrictions were on. Um, lockdowns emphasised the quality of both our internal and our external species and has put into sharp focus aspects of mental health. This talk will cover spaces across the city, their hidden stories and interesting histories. Um, and today I'm also joined by two other members of the West of Scotland Chapter Committee. Hi, I'm John. I've been a member of the committee since January of this year. And uh, until recently, I was a resident of uh, College Lands area of Glasgow, just up the high street, and I'm a charter town planner as well. Hi, uh, I'm Sean Kelly, and I've been a member of the committee for the last couple of years. Um, I'm also a charter town planner, and I live just on the outskirts of Glasgow. Okay, so the first site we're going to look at today is in the east end of Glasgow. Um, we're going to travel through the city for our other species. So this space first came to my attention when a new sign went up naming it as a Commonwealth woodland. Um, that would be in and around the Commonwealth Games in 2014. It's a triangular piece of land uh, sandwiched between London Road and the M74 um, and the more recently completed part of the M74 Junction 2A. Uh, Ochen is an old Gaelic name for meaning fields of rye. Um, so it would refer to an old land use that's definitely not in existence any longer. Um, and it's basically the area to the south of Tollcross Main Street and where Causeway Side Street meets London Road. Um, the number nine tram used to terminate there um, and uh, Auckland Sugar Woods was also the first community woodland and it was established in 1982. Ooh, sounds interesting, Jane. What were the previous uses on the site? Do you remember? Um, well, it looks like the Clyde Ironworks has, has a large history in, in that sort of vicinity. Um, mm. And I think part of that's been kind of taken away by the Junction 2A when that was completed in, yeah. in 2011. Um, Causeway Side Street used to extend right down into the site. Um, and there's a rough indication still of this road. You can see it in those photos uh, with the wall bounding and a kind of avenue of path through the trees. Um, the Fullerton House also used to be there with the associated gardens as well. There's uh -huh. no, there's no real records of that historically. There's nothing you can find really. Um, but there is some, some still foundations like you can see in the photos. There's parts of buildings there anyway. And the yeah. Fullerton area more generally used to belong to the British Steel Corporation um, and the Clyde Ironworks. Um, an old map show fire clay works in existence there at some point as well. Um, yeah, so that, that's all to the immediate south of Fullerton House, the clay down works and stuff. Mm -hmm. well, I was wondering why there was a, a street lamp in the middle of a forest, but I think you gave us the answer there. We're talking about that old street that used to run through. Um, how do you use the space yourself, Jane? Um, well, I was going out for lunchtime walks and um, it's quite near my dad's garage. Um, and it's quite nice just to escape into, like you can see it's quite mottled when the sun comes through the trees and it just feels like you're a million miles away from any city, even though you can still hear the traffic from the M74, it is quite a little bit of an oasis. Mm. I like the design of that, that lamppost, by the way, it's, it's quite um, uh, an unusual design for a lamppost, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Co concrete, it's concrete, it's nice. So, yeah. John, where have you been? Um, I know you're more in the city centre, so where have you been on your lockdown adventures? Uh, so the first, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of sites. Um, the first one that I would mention is Barrowlands Park. 
and that's uh, just to the east of Glasgow Cross, uh, where you've got the um, the Talbot steeple, and uh, it's I suppose sandwiched between Gallow Gate and London Road. Um, it was a, uh, a kind of a brownfield site. There were buildings on it, shops and things like that, uh, but it was a stalled site. There wasn't much happening with it. And uh, the city council intervened and essentially turned it into a temporary park in 2014 in time for the Commonwealth Games. It was designed or landscaped uh, by Loki Design. And there's a centerpiece which has a special place in my heart. It's called the Album Pathway. You can see it on the bottom photo there. And it's designed by a guy called Jim Lambie. And it essentially commemorates uh, artists, musicians who played at the local Barlands Ballroom uh, over the years. So it'll, it'll give the band name and the date they played at the Barlands. And uh, having seen one concert, hopefully more once we get back to normal uh, at the Barlands, uh, it's, it's a quite nice little um, journey that you can take through through musical history. Yeah. I've been to quite a few bands uh, in the Barrowlands. I've spent quite a bit of time walking up that path, spotting the ones that I've been to. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting piece of um, art, actually. I'm not even going to tell you what the first band was I've seen in the Barrowlands because it's quite, quite embarrassing, uh, but they are uh, on, on that uh, pathway. The space, I think, does provide quite a, um, a, a crucial open green sort of space in the city centre, which does sort of lack those spaces um, sometimes. But I think, John, there is another couple of sites, isn't there, that, uh, that people might want to be aware of in the city centre? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but before we go on to the next site, I'd just like to say that there is, um, this is considered a temporary site at present. However, there is a, a local group, uh, Friends of Barland Park, who, who want this to, to remain permanent. Uh, and I can see, um, mm -hmm. you know, why it, it, you know it looks it looks very nice so the, the next site there uh that i'll cover is uh rock and roll gardens now this has a a history which will be uh familiar to a lot of people who are watching this um webcast and it was the old the former site rider of glasgow Mater royal maternity hospital which was on this site between 1860 and 2001 and Following that, it was acquired by Strathclyde University. They turned it into a, uh, a quite a large uh, public garden uh, with uh, various landscape features. Um, now, the reason it was opened in 2004 was to celebrate the 40th anniversary of uh, the university's Royal Charter, which was granted uh, in 1964. Uh, but Strathclyde University actually has its origins in the Andersonian institution, which dates all the way back to 1796. Well, wow, that's some interesting facts, John. I noticed there's a community garden feature there as well, which um, is obviously becoming a much more popular feature throughout Glasgow. And we'll maybe mention one of those in another part of the city later on. Um, but I know that there's the, the old remnants of the, the old maternity hospital there. Do you know any more information about that, John? Yeah, so when, when I was first looking at this site, and it's, it's a place that, you know, was about 10 minutes from where I used to live in college lands. And uh, I went up and I saw all these kind of old porticos and things like that. So they've retained the old entrance portico on Rotten Row. Uh, it's not in these photos, but uh, if you go, um, you, you, can, you can have a look at that. that. It's kind of this grey polished stone facade. Um, and in the top right hand image there, you can see an old archway It actually reads Glasgow Maternity Hospital and like many buildings in Glasgow, it has the, the crest of the city that the arms um, uh, on display. Uh, so they're nice remnants of what used to be there and they kind of pique one's interest uh, when, when you're on site. Um, what I should also mention is that there is a um, a sculpture here called Matoto, which is a Greek for maternity, um, and it was installed uh, when the park was opened. Um, and it's essentially a, a massive seven meter tall uh, nappy pin with a bird perched on oh, top. Wow. And it's by an artist called George Wiley. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately hidden behind uh, some of the, 
the vegetation in these photos, but uh, it's a nice little thing to see if, if you do vis visit. Um, there are plans afoot, I should mention as well, to re-landscape the gardens in, in the coming years. Uh, so Strathclyde University have a, um, a strategy in place for that. And there is an aim to make the space more inclusive and accessible to all city residents. Good. And what I would say while we're talking about the sculpture, as we did earlier, there is another place that I feel is even more impressive um, that's just around the corner. And that's uh, Strathclyde University's Sculpture Garden, uh, which dates from the early 1970s when most of the university buildings were built here. Um, now, uh, some notes here, which I'll just uh, scroll down to. Um, it's, uh, it actually, so you can see the pathway there uh, in the, the lower right hand image and that runs east to west. That actually follows the, uh, the trajectory of Rotten Row itself, which, which ran all the way over to the cathedral uh, back in the day. And uh, it's, it's a, an enclosed space. It's really nice on a sunny day because the, the big lawn faces south. You've got a, a cascading water feature that runs to the west and north of the site. Um, and that's kind of, uh, you know, got a lot of trees which are, create this nice shaded glade on, on a hot day as we, we did in that hot spell in uh, April. Mm. You said there was the sculptures, we can see some of them in the photos there, John. What, what, what exactly is that? So this is designed by a, a guy called Gerald Lang and it was uh, installed here in 1974. And this site is actually the tallest part of natural part of the campus uh, at Strathclyde University. And um, it's 16 uh, Corten steel um, uh, columns, uh, which uh, each are 16 feet high, and they're supposed to evoke the Kalanish stones uh, in the Isle of Lewis. Now, this is also called Kalanish, but sometimes is referred to a steel henge. Mm. Ah. <laughs> um, and it's also worth noting that um, throughout this space, um, and you can see a clue to this in the top left hand image, you've got a little plaque below uh, a, a new sapling tree that has been installed. A lot of these trees are memorials to members of the university community who passed away. So it gives the, the space quite a a contemplative feel and it, it, it's quite a nice um you know uh, space for for uh, to remember it does look like a little green oasis uh, especially in that part of the city and i wasn't even aware of it myself actually so i need to take a walk up and uh, take a look through there um i think we're going to move to the west now to another university campus and jane you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, the glasgow university space aren't you because you are alumni from there I am indeed, yes. Um, but credit does go to one of our other members for the photos. Um, so yeah, University of Glasgow, which actually, funnily enough, was originally in the East End down at College Lands. I think that was the reason it's had its name more predominantly. Um, and the university was based there between 1500 and 1800 and moved up to the site on Gilmore Hill back in 1870, the building was built. Um, the quads, are, as you can see from the photos, very idyllic in the, in the sun and go and sit in the grass and the, there's an east and west quadrant that is in, in the centre piece is the, the cloisters which is those lovely archways um, and that's it's a really nice environment to be in, it feels very grand and be, feels very historical. Um, apparently it is bad luck to cross the grass if you haven't yet graduated, um, I can't say it was an issue for me. Um, but, you know, I wasn't really aware of it at the time, I didn't do damage. Um, uh, having been to a, 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 a university in Ireland where there was such superstitions in operation, if you walked under a bell tower, you, you'd fail all your exams. So actually, I, I didn't until the night I graduated. But anyway, I digress. Um, I've 
I was under the impression Harry Potter was filmed here, but I'm wrong. It was not uh, filmed here, despite the architecture and uh, what what might look like Warner Brothers Studios down down in England. But um, just a, a quick couple of facts that I know about the building on Gilmore Hill, just the, the main one that everyone knows. Um, it was designed by Sir George Gilbert Scott and his son completed the design then after he passed away, particularly the, the top of the, the tower, the steeple. Um, George Gilbert Scott also designed a, a building that may be familiar to anyone who's, who's gone down to, to London, um, uh, the Midland Great o Grand Hotel at St Pancras Station, which is essentially the front of St Pancras Station, a big red brick facade with a clock tower. That's also the same architect that, as this. Um, this building at Gilmore Hill is in the, the Gothic Revival style, and it's actually the second biggest building of this type in the UK, apart from uh, Hazard Parliament down in Westminster. And then the final fact, before I bore you to death, is that uh, Sir George Gilbert Scott's grandson, uh, Giles Gilbert Scott, designed Liverpool Anglican Cathedral in the 1930s, and also Battersea Power Station in London and Bankside Power Station, which a lot of people will know better as Tate Modern, which uh, it was converted into in the year 2000. Wow, so a family of renowned architects then and important buildings throughout the UK. I think that just nods to how important Glasgow as a city was um, during the Industrial Revolution and beyond. Um, Thanks for that, John. So I think we're going to move now to another part of the city, up near where uh, I live, to the northwest of the city, and back to, well, next to uh, another campus of the University of Glasgow. And this is to uh, Doss Home Park, which is a, a hidden gem that I discovered during lockdown. It's largely natural, for those who don't know. Um, it's quite wooded as well. It's got a very secluded sort of feel. It straddles the border between Glasgow and Eastern Bartonshire, so actually it's quite accessible for a large number of people. Um, the River Kelvin runs right through it, which helps to add a kind of rural, wild um, character to it, and there are other paths either side. Um, I'm not a bird watcher, but I am told that uh, the, the wildlife and the bird watching is quite good there. So if you are going to take a walk up, then I'd recommend bringing your binoculars if you're into bird watching. Uh, it's multifunctional. Uh, there are sports pitches and things adjacent to the park. It's very popular dog walk dog walkers and there's spaces for picnics and things and even dips in the river if you want because the river's not actually that um, fast running there. Um, I wasn't actually aware of the space as I said before uh, before lockdown and uh, it was actually when I was out in one of my lunchtime runs and I was getting a bit bored of the usual routes that I peered behind a hedge and discovered a quite a well-established route actually through it so um, it's been a bit of a lifesaver for me actually it's about a five minute walk so I can jaunter down at lunchtime and get back um, and time for the next call or whatever. So yeah, it's a, a good space that I'm enjoying actually a lot just now. That's really interesting, John. Um, it's good to find a little hidden gem sometimes as well. Yeah, like yours, Jane, I suppose. Yeah, it means it's much smaller, that said. Um, <laughs> what, what's the history of the site? Is there, is there anything interesting that was there before? Uh, well, I don't actually know the history of Dawson Park itself, other than uh, next to it used to be a, an old private estate, and I think it did start life off as a, as a plantation. Um, I know that there always has been public recreation around there. There was the old estate house, and I think there were uh, tennis courts and things around there too. As far as I understand, though, the only remnants of that Gars Cube House, I think it was called, that's left is some ruins from the outbuildings. Um, so a bit of a shame because actually it's worth Googling images of Gars Cube House. It was a grand affair. Um, but now actually, if you uh, look next to the park, Glasgow University's uh, veterinary campus is there. And then there's also um, the, the Cancer Research Centre too, which is, I think was one of the first large green roofs in Glasgow. That's quite impressive as well. So definitely work having a really good look around when you when you take a look up there. That's Thanks. really interesting. Mm. Um, I should mention as well that I visited the southern uh, part of Dawes Home Park, south of the River Kelvin, back in February on a very, very rainy day. And, and we were intending to do some bird watching, but the birds weren't cooperating on that particular day. We did see yeah. some uh, cormorants uh, perched on some old uh, bridge abutments in the middle of the river. And yeah. uh, 
yeah on, on that note actually there's there's so much kind of so many remnants of old infrastructure along the kelvin and uh, some of the, the bridges that are still there because many have been removed uh, they form quite uh, useful highways for animals to cross the river kelvin um, so uh, it's always good looking back in the old maps and seeing all the yeah. railway sidings that used to exist there that's a good point actually and one thing just on the rain by the way one word of warning if you are going to go that bottom picture uh, that I took on one of my runs looks quite tropical actually to me but see right around the corner from there is a massive mud pit so um, if you are going to go, <laughs> go down there for a run then just beware uh, of the soggy weather bring your wellies if you're not in a run <laughs> yes um, so we're going to segue uh, to a different uh, site now, which is still in the, in the western uh, area of the city, uh, and that's Gart Naval Hospital. Um, so this, it's, I suppose it was, a, it is a wooded hillside location, but in 1843, the Royal Lunatic Asylum was, was uh, relocated here, uh, presumably because it was a, a bit more of a, a secluded location, a, a place for, for uh, patients to, to recover in, in more peaceful surroundings. And uh, since then, it has become a general hospital. It's been extended considerably. Um, and despite that, you can walk around it, even if you're, if you're not attending the hospital itself. Um, there, there are loads of winding paths through the woodland, there's a lovely uh, open green space to the west, which is really good for catching the evening sunlight when you do get sun in Glasgow. Um, and its ornate chapel has been converted into the Kalman Cancer Support Centre as well. Isn't there a Maggie Centre up there, John? There is. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, Maggie's is a charity, a cancer support charity as well that uh, they were founded in 1996. And how I came to know about them was that they tend to have uh, very well-known architects design their centers throughout the country. And, um, you know, there's ones at Dundee, at Aberdeen, if you just want to, you know, do an internet search for Maggie's Dundee, you'll, you'll see a really interesting building. Uh, and a lot of these are uh, designed in such a way that, um, the people who are attending the centre can uh, look out the window and have this beautiful kind of natural vista and it, 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 it helps, I, I think, uh, when, when you're in that kind of situation. Um, this particular one was designed by OMA, which was founded in Rotterdam by Rem Koolhaas, and uh, it's, uh, I suppose, it's, it's, it's got a ring shape, um, with interlocking rooms and they've all got really like full full height glazing that looks out into the the green space outside so it looks like a really um, uh, soothing space to, to, to be in uh, at what can be a, a difficult time. Mm. Uh, that brings us to the next location uh, which is a Bingham's Pond which I think Jane Jane is going to talk about also in the West End and just north of Cartnavel, I'm told. Yeah, so it's very close to the, the site we've just covered. Um, this was another uh, contribution by one of the members of our committee, uh, John Walls, and a special credit goes out to uh, Jim Coyle for the use of the information and the photos. Um, Bingham's Pond is located, as we said, in the West End of Glasgow. And it can be accessed from uh, Great Western Road and Shelley Road. And the car park is a, a joining hotel. It's recognised by Glasgow City Council as being a locally important wildlife site um, and it's been called a, a, a sink. Um, this, it's hoped that it may eventually be upgraded to a natural uh, reserve, local nature reserve, sorry. Um, the pond was created in the 1880s uh, and it was the site of a former old brick and coal pits works area. Um, it got its name from the Bingham family who used to hire out boats on the pond in the summer. Um, it was subsequently sold in the 1950s and eventually the Eastern Park was infilled and a hotel was built there in the 1960s. The remainder of it has been subject to some landscape improvements and managed as a small park by the Glasgow Corporation. Interesting Jim and 
were you just talking there about it perhaps being turned into a local nature reserve, which is obviously something incredibly important at this point. I mean, in my day-to-day -day job, um, I work on, on open space quality and nature-based solutions, and it sounds like this space might be moving in that direction. Have you got any more information about, um, about the most recent improvements in the space? Um, yes, yeah, so the, in 2003, following some complaints, the council decided to naturalise the pond as a means of improving like, the water quality. Um, and mm. making it better for wild, wildlife um, and just generally more attractive for people. This is eventually was completed in 2005. The naturalisation was funded by a number of bodies, um, the Kelvin Clyde Project, Land Trust, West End Area Committee, the SNH and SEPA. So a big partnership uh, went into that and circa about 35,000 um, was spent to get it to that stage. Uh, with the Parks and Recreation Department making up any shortfalls. Uh, the parks also funded the repair to the boundary um, wall and the installation of new seats and litter bins. So mm -hmm. uh, the naturalisation appears to have been extremely successful, uh, with the water quality has been improved. Five species of water birds are breeding there, and a whole range of other birds, amphibians, insects have been attracted. So obviously in biodiversity terms, yeah. once you feed the one, you've attracted a, a number yeah. of other. A good model for other parts of the city as well. Yeah, apparently um, the tufted duck, the mallard, the coot, the moorhen, mute swan, <laughs> and other water birds, goose sanders have been all found there, grey herons and occasional cormorant um, wow. and, and the surrounding trees. Um, and there's been species of tit and dunnock and robin, whack things, there's uh, gulls, Iceland gulls, kitty wakes. Uh, that it's quite spectacular the amount of. Um, wow. It sounds like if, if people are up in Doss Home bird watching, they have to get down there with their binoculars too, maybe. Yeah, definitely. So I think uh, Jim Coyle and Etta is the, the people he speaks to and is in partnership with, is that the pond will become that local nature reserve. Um, and that just gives it, I suppose, that further protection. Um, mm. So that is, sounds like a really good little place. In <laughs> Uh, yeah, we should we should say that yeah that that group that that Jim is part of uh, is the friends of Glasgow's local nature reserves, and I know that Jane mentioned the the acronym SYNC earlier. So for anyone who doesn't know what SYNC is, and I'm sure there will be a few, it's it's site of importance for nature conservation. Uh, so we weren't calling it a, a kitchen sink, but anyway, <laughs> um, we, we're we're going to move on to another West End. I think it's a final West End. Um, park that we're going to cover before heading south of the river. Um, it's Hayburn Park and uh, essentially this, this is a small uh, southwest facing uh, park which serves the Hindland and Partick Hill areas and it's home to an array of flora, mature trees, there's some fruit trees there, there's flowering meadows, you can see some uh, kind of playground and a, a table tennis table as well so it's got a lot for, for such a small uh, space. Um, and I'm sure the, the local residents really, really enjoy it on, on a day like has been taken, taken uh, by our uh, colleague Miguel there, uh, the photo. Um, the residential streets were built and enclosed the space in the late 19th century. And from 1980s onwards, the Hayburn Play Park Association have cared for the park. Now in 2014 the park hosted the Deer Green Games which was part of the Commonwealth Games um, portfolio and I think Sean you have some more information about community in this particular space. Yeah, yeah a, a colleague of mine actually um, is a member of the local community there and I know that um, there's been a really strong sense of community cohesion around this and around the transformation of the park um, recently. And uh, it's not just a, a park, you know, there's a lot more going on behind that because um, it's obviously used by the residents, but there's a lot of different activities attached to the park, uh, community activities and events and things, um, and other things too that have sparked off from it as well. So it's a really good example actually of um, where a community can get together and uh, transform a local space like that into such a multifunctional, usable space. So again, another good model actually, and uh, it's, it's only fairly recently got to the stage that it's at. So it's definitely worth taking a, a walk down and taking a look. Um, so yeah, and I think we're going to go to the last stop now, which brings us to uh, Bella Houston Walled Garden in the south side. 
And, uh, you know, I think most people will be familiar with Bella Houston Park itself, but maybe not the walled garden. So the walled garden sits within Bella Houston Park itself and it's just beside House of an Art Lover. It is an enclosed uh, garden and it is uh, constructed with traditional bricks, so there is a nice sense of enclosure when you're in it. It's actually quite a great spot because from um, the northern, southern part of the site, uh, is elevated, so when you look north, you get quite good views sometimes of the of the Trossachs in the distance. So worth keeping an eye out for that, particularly in the demonstration garden area. Um, it used to be the kitchen garden for Ibrox Hill House, which again was an old house, a bit like uh, Gar's Cube that I mentioned before. Uh, unfortunately, that was demolished in 1914. Um, although you will notice that in the park, the entrance portico still exists. So if you want, you can still take a walk through that. It's worth having a look. Um, the current use of the garden uh, has basically returned to a uh, food growing slash demonstration garden, which is quite nice because it did used to be uh, a kitchen garden that grew food for the for the local um, mansion house, basically. So uh, it's used by a number of community of interest groups. Uh, the focus is on upskilling, uh, on growing skills, local food production, and creating community cohesion as well. Um, local groups include local schools, uh, charities, health boards, and Police Scotland are also uh, quite supportive of, of it. And actually, this is another model of a community garden that we're trying to replicate in other parts of the city too. And we're eyeing up a project just now in Drum Chapel, hoping to follow this model, not in a walled garden, but with the, the same sort of community um, uh, cohesion as well. Um, other parts of the garden look particularly nice in the summer. So you can see the picture there of, um, I'm, I'm really terrible with flowers, I can't, can't name them. <laughs> they just look bright and beautiful. So worth taking a look down to that part of the old garden too. Uh, you mentioned House for an Art Lover. I visited that just before lockdown and I was astounded to, to kind of learn that, well, not only was it built on the site of Ibrox Hill House, uh, uh, but in the 1990s, so that oh, yeah. it, it was a Macintosh yes. design, but it was uh, it was intended to be kind of built and open for the the 1990s City of Culture year, uh, but then it actually ended up being opened in the mid 90s because uh, you can imagine the amount of detail and and artisan work that had to go into a house that was faithful to the the Charles Rennie Macintosh designs. Um, I know that the Empire Exhibition was there, somewhere near there, but I don't know too much about it. Sean, do you, do you know anything about that? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the Empire Exhibition took place in Bell Houston Park itself, not exactly in the Walled Garden, um, although that was part of it. I think it's fair to say that the, the Empire Exhibition is probably more infamous, infamous now than, than famous. Um, the, the key part of that as well was a, a 300 foot tower called Tate Tower. And uh, it's worth Googling images of that too. I don't think we've got in here, but um, it's basically had a, an amazing art deco design. But unfortunately they took it down after the exhibition. Um, and the, the rumor was it was because it, it could have become a target during the, the Second World War, which obviously happened the following year. Um, but apparently that wasn't the case. And there are other reasons why the tower was taken down and they have yet to be revealed. So worth maybe <laughs> taking a dig through old records to find that out. Um, so yeah, interesting uh, that that's, you know, what happened back then. I, I'm not sure we'd be celebrating the Empire these days in such the same way. Um, but worth noting that the Walled Garden is normally opened uh, for Doors Open Day, but obviously this year for uh, reasons because of the pandemic, it's not going to be. Uh, but worth keeping an eye out for future events because uh, the, the community groups that are organised within the Walled Garden do do different events through the year, barbecues and so on. And hopefully it'll be back on the schedule again for Doors Open Day 2021. So yeah, that's us guys. That was a whistle stop tour um, of Glasgow and uh, some of the lesser known sites. I think you'll agree. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. It was good for us, uh, for me, especially looking at some of these sites, which I wasn't even aware of. Having lived in the city for such a long time, I'm kind of ashamed of myself, uh, but I'm going to get out and get exploring. Um, feel free to get in touch with us. You can see our Twitter handle there. Um, we might be able to answer some of the questions for you on those sites, but probably best Googling, I would say, uh, in the first instance. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thanks again. I would take a look out for next year because we uh, did have some ambitious plans this year with Glasgow Building Preservation Trust to do a, a Doors Open Day uh, event, which would have been uh, quite, quite an interesting affair. So we're hoping to take that on again next year. So keep an eye out for the RTPI's event next year.
Thanks for listening, folks. Yeah, thanks very much for listening.